All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Josh Wood from CoreOS. I'm here with Jesus Carrillo, uh, Senior Software or Senior Systems Engineer at Ticketmaster. Um, we're going to talk a little bit this afternoon about a concept we've developed at, at CoreOS, or a pattern you might call it, for the management of sophisticated, stateful, complex applications uh, on Kubernetes and in terms of the Kubernetes API. We call that concept operators. If we do a good job this afternoon, I will help to introduce some of the general principles and ideas behind that, give a couple examples of those that we've developed ourselves or that we see in the field, and then I think the really fun part of this will be when Jesus tells us about their use of a particular operator uh, at Ticketmaster to run a particular piece of mission-critical software in their overall services stack. <clears throat> So welcome, Cloud Native Con, KubeCon 17, uh, and thanks for coming. Um, how many folks here have heard of Kubernetes? <laughs> um, and I, you know, the thing we all love the most about Kubernetes, or certainly that drew my interest to it, and I think has drawn corporate interest, open source developer interest, uh, and certainly industrial interest in the platform over the last year, year and a half since it's open sourcing, is how easy it makes it to scale stateless applications. Um, if we're talking about something like a web front end or uh, any simple app that doesn't have connections to persistent storage, uh, that doesn't have its own notion, notions of clustering or internode communication, um, scaling applications on Kubernetes is as simple as using the kubectl scale command to scale a running application, say from one, two, three. Um, how does this work? Well, we refer to the parts of Kubernetes that provide command and control lifecycle management uh, as the control plane, and that name comes from the primary piece of software that runs in that control plane, which we call a controller. Um, the basic stock Kubernetes controller has a simple job. Um, it looks at the desired state of an application or deployment described by a YAML manifest file or otherwise uh, coordinated by an administrator, compares it to the actual state of that deployment or application running the cluster, and it takes actions or steps to reconcile those two states. This, in essence, is the controller concept. You could call it an OODA loop. Um, you can observe, act, and make decisions to correct situations. So. Let's say I have two pods running for my simple web server application. I just issued a kubectl scale for three replicas. Uh, essentially, the controller loop looks at the difference between my desired state and the actual condition of the universe and adds a pod so that now I have three. We've even made this simple enough that you can do it with a graphical application in our tectonic console um, and take a look at the number of pods running, ask for one more, um, and you can watch it come up running live here in this sort of uh, animated slide. So take a look at the cube scheduler. We just ask for two, two are running. Very simple, stateless applications. But what about apps that, you know, store data? I, some of my applications tend to read and write files or record things in a database, or have other notions of connection that expand beyond what these kinds of stateless apps uh, expect in the world and, and are less easy to migrate between cluster node members uh, in the event of application failure or scaling requests like the one we just looked at. Um, we'd really like it if managing complex apps like databases and file systems were as easy on Kubernetes as creating them is. Um, and as easy to manage and scale those apps as the simple stateless app that we took a short example look at. It's not too hard to say kubectl runs some database and you got an image and you bring it up and it's running. However, what if that database has its own notions of clustering um, in terms of uh, masters and slaves or leaders and followers? Where are the files that record the persistent data for that database located in terms of cluster resources? How do the pods that implement the database application find, connect to, gain authentication, or otherwise access those stateful resources? When these items exist in stateful applications, um, when there's a, a notion of clustering within that application, like in database or distributed file system apps, how do we resize or upgrade the members of that cluster without disturbing their own clustering connections to one another while still doing it in terms of the Kubernetes API, kubectl, and the other tools we use to manage uh, Kubernetes? S 
Secondly, how do we reconfigure these kinds of applications when it's not enough to tell them make one more copy of this? How do we issue commands for locating persistent data stores, persistent special network connections, perhaps even uh, access to particular compute resources? Last but not least, any of these complex apps with complex data uh, that persists somewhere in the world, either in object storage, disk, some kind of a volume claim in the end, that data needs to be backed up and managed with its own notion of uh, what a, a life cycle of data preservation looks like. All of these things are beyond the knowledge of the basic stock Kubernetes controller in the control plane and are beyond the features presented by the stock default Kubernetes API. If only Kubernetes knew about complex applications. So the answer to make that happen is to take advantage of the extensibility designed into the API and the Kubernetes architecture to extend Kubernetes to work with particular applications. The goal is to come up with something simple that extends the Kubernetes API to let us talk about things we can't currently describe in API terms today. What's the size of a cluster of databases or file servers that I want to have running on my Kubernetes cluster? How many of those members are read replicas, followers, or slaves in their own notion of a clustering system? What version? of the software of the data store format is my distributed database or distributed file store using while running on my Kubernetes cluster. Operators are a way to encode this specific application knowledge from a human administrator or operations team into software and pair it with extensions to the Kubernetes API in the form of third party resources to allow Kubernetes to manage these complex stateful applications in terms of the Kubernetes API while at the same time doing this in an extensible modular way that doesn't disturb or interfere with or add complexity to the basic primitives that make up the Kubernetes architecture. I think the easiest way possibly to bring this into some kind of real picture that you can reason about is to take a look at one of the original operators we initiated at CoreOS as we begin to define and explore this operator's pattern. How many of you have heard of etcd? It's a really, like, it's a hard conference to ask questions to, right? Like, I, I, like how many of you are familiar with the Diet of Worms in 1331? I mean, you know, like, you have to change subject matter or everybody raises their hands. etcd is a very popular distributed key value store. It solves a hard problem in distributed computing and does it in a simple lightweight way that human beings are at least somewhat able to uh, reason about by implementing the RAF protocol rather than Poxos for consensus in distributed databases. In short, what etcd does is store little bitty pieces of information that need to be coordinated and kept consistent among multiple members storing that data around a cluster. You find etcd at the heart of Kubernetes storing cluster application deployment services metadata uh, for the stock Kubernetes control plane. etcd is also an important member of many other popular distributed applications uh, from our friends in the open source and industrial communities. That's why uh, this was sort of all on that slide. Uh, that's why uh, etcd is uh, one of the very first things for which we tried to build an operator. So to review our basic operator ideas, operators build on key Kubernetes concepts like the controller, the control reconciliation loop, and the API itself, which it extends through third party resources. Um, <clears throat> and TPRs extend that API with new API objects. And you can think of these kind of like a database table schema, like this is the data model for this particular special application that we need to manage with an operator. Um, extensions added to the API through third party resources include some of those samples that we were looking at in our idealized YAML description of an etcd cluster manifest, cluster size, cluster version for etcd. <clears throat> Now, of course, the TPR mechanism was designed to build exactly these kinds of extensions onto uh, the Kubernetes API. <clears throat> so with the etcd operator, um, we've built an operator that knows how to manage etcd clusters and keep them running reliably over their lifecycle at scale. 
Deploying this operator looks really, really simple on the surface. You point it at a YAML file, and at the end of the talk, I'll give you the URLs where you need to find this. All of the work I'm speaking about today is open source, so you can try this out on any Kubernetes cluster pretty much immediately. This actually deploys the operator itself rather than an etcd cluster. What happens after this step is we have now added the third-party resources and the custom controller binary in the cluster that are then able to deploy, create, and manage etcd clusters for us. Now again, looking at a sort of a idealized deployment for an etcd cluster, these extensions may not be numerous or even in a great amount of depth. They just provide us the keys we need to make API manipulations of an application around which the API was not originally designed. So we're looking at how big is our cluster, what version of etcd should be running in that cluster. Pairing those extensions to third-party resources with our custom controller, we have a replacement or augmentation of a human etcd operator that knows how to deploy etcd clusters by deploying a master, writing the initial data store, adding new member nodes and connecting them, maintaining the etcd client endpoint where applications access etcd services, how to backup etcd in a data lifecycle management sense and also how to perform spot backups before automatically undertaking operations like restorations of failed nodes, re-additions of new nodes to the existing etcd cluster, and maybe most interestingly upgrades in versions both of the etcd binaries and the etcd data store format between different versions of etcd. So to take a look on the screen here, if you look at sort of group one, we have, we have what the controller maybe would consider the picture of reality, the thing we are going to compare to our desired state. Well, if you look back at the YAML we were showing, our desired state is considerably different from the state represented in block A here. We want three pods, we only have two running. We want them all to be running etcd version 3.1.0, but we actually can see that of the two that are running, only one of them is running the version we requested. So just as in a, standards, a standard Kubernetes controller, but with additional specific applica application knowledge, the etcd custom controller that comprises with the third party resources, the etcd operator, can examine the difference between reality, desired state, and knows how to actually take steps in etcd specific terms to bring the condition of the etcd cluster to that described in the desired state that we showed in the manifest file. What's that really going to mean in this particular highly simplified idealized illustration? It's going to mean that we're going to first of all recover at least one member because we're short of uh, uh, one member of the three we've actually requested to have running our cluster. We are going then to actually back up the data store shared by that entire etcd cluster because the next and perhaps most important step that we're going to take in our reconciliation is upgrading that recalcitrant 3.09 member to 3.10. Uh, in short, that's what the etcd operator does. Those are the basic Kubernetes primitives. It extends to accomplish that work. And it is open source code, which you can examine, use to run your own etcd uh, clusters at scale on Kubernetes, manage them in terms of kubectl commands in the Kubernetes API. Uh, and additionally, the etcd operator is currently one of the best and cleanest base examples of where you might start writing your own operators. Um, in addition to etcd, like we've seen several operators arise both inside CoreOS and in the field. Um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about things we either are working on right now or have just delivered in the etcd operator and what it means to, to some of our product and project offerings. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot at CoreOS is this idea of self-driving, self-hosted, automatically updating infrastructure. Uh, CoreOS Container Linux, rather famously, um, automatically updates uh, with a sort of AB rollback partition scheme in a really similar way to your Chromebook or your mobile phone. Uh, we're actually able to deliver Linux 
operating system upgrades rather than being bound by dependencies. Uh, we can deliver these upgrades because the container gives us isolation between OS and application layer. To the same, to the same end, we are trying to drive this idea of self-updating, auto-updating, self-driving infrastructure up through the stack from the operating system to things like etcd and to Kubernetes itself. The operator work is a key underpinning of how we're delivering self-driving infrastructure and delivering Kubernetes clusters that can upgrade and manage their own life cycles over time rather than requiring manual or administrator uh, um, activity at upgrade points. Um, the etcd operator lies very near the heart of how that work is being delivered. If you look at the latest release last week of Tectonic 155, Dot two, uh, shortly before the Kubernetes 1.6 release. Uh, and in our blog post making the release announcement for this, we talk in some detail about the more high availability etcd version that was delivered in this last release. A lot of that is built around the, the concepts of, of operators and how they manage and automate the management of etcd. Um, now I am going to talk about one of the other operators that we've built uh, in the team and, and another open source operator for managing uh, the Prometheus monitoring and alerting system. How many folks here use Prometheus to monitor their systems? You're supposed to raise your hand, I see. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so Prometheus is a really neat monitoring system, um, do a lot of charts and graphs, we can take many, many detailed measurements and much of the Kubernetes API and uh, the sort of pod interface and applications that you run on Kubernetes are instrumented in ways that Prometheus can gain insight to and report statistics and measurements from. Out of those statistics and measurement, you can construct reliable, meaningful alerting systems for when things do go wrong and people have to take action, or perhaps alerts that fire operator actions in an idealized automated world. Um, before I take too much time, I'm going to point out that our Prometheus operator is like the etcd operator, open source work that anyone can use and roll out. One of the folks that has taken a lot of initiative in rolling this operator out, learning it in deep detail, and building production systems with it at scale at his place of employment, I happen to have standing on stage with me today. So I would actually like to turn this over to Jesus Carrillo from Ticketmaster, who's going to take the general outline of what operators might be and what they can accomplish and drive them down to the practical level of what Ticketmaster and Jesus' teams are doing with the Prometheus operator at Ticketmaster today. Jesus? Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jesus Carrillo. I work at Ticketmaster. And today I'm going to talk about uh, our journey on um, deploying and using Prometheus at Ticketmaster. So first of all, I want to set the context here. Um, and I want to tell you um, how Ticketmaster is going to use or is using Prometheus. So as, as we transition to a DevOps model, um, we are getting rid of um, OpenTSDV because it's a, a gigantic burden in our operations teams uh, to keep um, huge OpenTSDV cluster alive. Um, we are replacing legacy on um, alerting systems. And now each team is going to own its own monitoring and alerting, uh, which it's better that way. So uh, we, uh, we started evaluating uh, Prometheus, and we did a proof of concept. Um, it's super basic, and uh, it was close to teams that um, they had already instrumented applications, and um, making them uh, Prometheus compatible was an easy step. And teams that were in the process of migrating their applications to AWS and uh, wanted to take the extra step to make it uh, Prometheus enabled. The architecture of this POC was super simple. It was um, Prometheus and Alert Manager running on very C2 instances. And it was, sharing it was shared between teams. So the POC architecture looks something like that. Um, we had a federation, and the federation is just another set of Prometheuses um, scraping the um, lower layer Prometheuses and aggregating all the metrics into a single point so we can hook up Grafana and do pretty uh, graphs um, at a single point. 
what what we what problems we encountered and the lessons that we learned um, with this POC. Um, we were hitting a lot of federation script timeouts because the data set that the um, lower level uh, Prometheus were uh, getting it was huge, so we couldn't um, get a, like a one minute resolution uh, because the data set was too too big and we were, we went we didn't have time to get all the metrics. Uh, bad configurations can disrupt the service. Um, there was a um, merge request that um, had a typo, and the new alert rules weren't evaluated for like a day. Um, then um, at, at the federation side, um, tweaking the storage parameters takes time, and uh, it's a like try and er error. Um, if I increase the instance size and more memory to the instance, um, I had to go back and tweak those parameters. And also, um, the teams were facing a lot of um, network ACLs problems, or network is highly restricted. Um, so we, we had to find a way to make this, um, the user experience better. Uh, what we learned is that each team should have its own Prometheus stack, and we need to divide to concur. So then we say, OK, uh, let's roll out Prometheus as a service so the teams can just quickly deploy their Prometheus stack and get a lot of things out of the box with it. So the Prometheus as a service must allow the teams to quickly deploy a, a um, dedicated stack. And I had the goal of making it a two minutes Prometheus stack. Um, it shouldn't represent any additional burden to the teams, so they just Prometheus should just work for them and be always up to date. Um, and also provide pre-configured EC2 and Kubernetes service discovery based, uh, for EC2 based on um, tags and Kubernetes service discovery based on annotations. And also, it should be based on Helm because uh, we could roll out um, newer versions of the um, service discovery templates um, pretty quickly and easy. And then we came up with a, exporter, a ticket master exporter database. So to solve the network ACL problems, we um, provided a, a well-known port of, uh, of uh, a well-known port range for the exporters. We opened the ACLs. And also, all the scrape jobs and EC2 service discovery, uh, it's based on this um, database, exporter database. Then, uh, so how we can um, achieve this? Uh, well, with the Prometheus operator, uh, it knows, it allows us to model a complex Prometheus um, stack um, in a few lines of code of configuration. Um, also, for the federation, the uh, storage is auto-tuned. So if I increase the memory limit for the pod uh, that is running a federation workload, the Prometheus operator uh, does the math and configures it. And an important thing is that Alert Manager uh, it's highly available by default with the um, Prometheus operator. I just need to say, um, give me three replicas of um, Alert Manager, and it will configure the clustering for it. So what we're looking forward with um, this Prometheus operator, um, we, we are really interested in the Federation TPR, because right now it's manually, and also Federation sharding. Because, and, and this is really important for us in an on-sale. I don't want to be 2 a.m. in the morning preparing for an on-sale and have to scale everything and chart it manually, right? Um, and also Grafana integration. So if a um, new Prometheus stack is deployed to the Kubernetes cluster, um, I can have the um, data source added for it. And one interesting thing is the company adoption rate. Uh, everyone loves it. Uh, we have two weeks of uh, production ready clusters, and the adoption rate is huge. Uh, right now, we, are, we have like four teams 
that are running their production grade monitoring and alerting on Prometheus, uh, Prometheus and the Prometheus operator. And we have like uh, 40 teams that are evaluating it in our development clusters. And this is a quick um, chart of, of how our architecture looks. We are using tectonic clusters, and we have deployed um, a set of um, EC2 instances that are running, that, are, that has um, specific network ACLs to be able to reach the EC2 instances on the um, port range that we carve for this. And then um, we are using node selectors to schedule the Prometheus workloads to those specific nodes. And we also have um, Calicon Canal for network policy. And then the federation um, stores the data into an EBS volume. Uh, EBS is, e the EBS uh, provisioning is also managed by the operator, so we don't need to do anything there. Does anyone has questions about this? Question, since I, I don't know if we have the question mic room in the audience that seems to be sitting up here on the podium, but the question was uh, not specific to the Prometheus operator, but in general, how do operators as a concept or a pattern compare to things like Helm, some of the other deployment distribution techniques we've seen arise around the Kubernetes ecosystem? And secondly, like you made a suggestion that operators maybe seem to you more like a concept or a way of doing things. So I'll start at the end. I think you're right in that sense. Um, the way, what I, what I think I like to think of operators, capital O, as a pattern or a concept, a way that complex applications can be managed on Kubernetes. We have not boiled operators down to an API that you can use to easily construct your own. I would imagine the future of that and the work that I know about in trying to generalize that stuff is to is, is probably going to look more like an, like an SDK, like sort of maybe skeletal sample code, things that you begin to build on top of, uh, a few functions that are the main abstracts that we've repeated in our development of several different operators for different apps. But one of the key things about operators and why we didn't necessarily go directly to the Kubernetes API and instead extended it through the TPR mechanism and these custom controllers it, their very nature and purpose is the long-term management of the life cycle of specific applications. They do encode a lot of application-specific knowledge that we don't necessarily think belongs architecturally in the main Kubernetes API, um, which is why we chose to go sort of this route of extending the API. So the, the long-term, how do I build my own operator question that, that this sort of train of thought leads us to is, Today, unfortunately or fortunately, early days, all this is pretty new stuff, you can take a look at the existing actual operator code. At least in the etcda operator, there has been some work to abstract the general operator functions somewhat from the etcd functions, but they still live in a single code base right now. In the future, I would expect there to be something like an SDK, a basic software development kit that is like the, the bottom of an operator, the, the place where you might start writing your own. So how do operators compare to Helm? I am, here's a, I'm gonna answer this somewhat glibly and, and not even make any attempt to hide my ignorance of one side of the question. I know a little bit about Helm. Um, I certainly like all the folks at Deus, and I think I've even been out there to Boulder to speak. Uh, and, and so like, I don't, I just don't happen to know a lot about Helm and use it on a day in, day out. From my knowledge, which is limited, Jesus might have a comment after I wrap up here. Helm is very, very deploy and replicate oriented. It, it feels more like configuration management if you map it to an older kind of concept or something we maybe all have shared knowledge about, an idea of what we think like config management is. 
Operators are a long running application that stays with these special applications as they run on Kubernetes clusters and not only deploy them in easy single command line ways, but manage their overall lifecycle, can actually upgrade them when an upgrade is available, not when you run a set of Helm commands to deploy a new version and a new chart. And I think that's pretty much how I see the difference between between like the like what I know that folks do with Helm versus what I do know about operators and what I do myself with operators. Uh, I could even, and here will be where I go too far and really reveal my ignorance, I could even imagine a Helm chart that deployed some kind of custom operator. It might handle the deployment and replication of that deployment over and over again to then spin up the operator which would then handle the actual lifecycle management of the app over time after that deployment. Yep, so for example, we're using Helm to um, tell the operator that we need a um, Prometheus instance, right? Um, so we, we use it to generate like the, um, in the examples that um, Josh did, um, the, the YAML file that gets pushed to the API and, and we, with Helm, we, with Helm, we construct the, the TPR um, configurations and then say to Kubernetes, hey, deploy this, and then the operator takes it, and it knows how to, for example, create an alert manager and create a cluster of alert managers. But that's a, that's a difference, right? Go for it. Um, not yet, because it has a lot of um, Ticketmaster specific stuff. Uh, because, for example, we do our EC2 service discovery, it's based on our own EC2 tags. So, yeah, may maybe we can do something later. In some place in the, in the website, in, uh, on GitHub, I think of Kubernetes, uh, um, it, it was indicated that in the roadmap, there's a plan to actually incorporate Helm charts into uh, Prometheus operators. So I was wondering if that's... Which would be, which is more something I should know yeah. and then, <laughs> than something <laughs> Hazel said Ticketmaster should know. By the way, the previous question that was asked, it has an answer on the Q&A. And that's like, but your answer was actually better. Thank you. I, okay, so the, the roadmap piece I actually did not know about at all, and, so, and I should have. The question on the Q and A thing, I, but I, hope, I hope I use it to inform my answer because I was trying to do a little bit larger thing, but that's kind of confusing. And yeah, I don't, I don't personally have a whole bunch of detailed knowledge about that plan to bring home into the, the problem operator. Interesting idea. Clearly, clearly, as we talk more about operators, because this question has come up in some degree before, home is something that springs into people's mind. I'm going to have to spend some time with home and be able to understand it. Practical way is gets the difference a little bit better. Right now, my understanding of Helm is pretty super well. As an important Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the question is are there plans for operators for complex? database applications like MySQL uh, or PostgreSQL. Um, we have done experimental work on them. Um, definitely for PostgreSQL, that is a piece of our overall infrastructure out at some edges and would be important to us. And they are also, those are exactly the kind of apps that we would expect to see community development on. I know about this much about uh, early stages PostgreSQL operator um, that that if I, since I don't have it on my slides, I'll try to look it up after this talk and I can maybe hand you a URL a little shortly afterwards. That's the only like, here's extant work and code that I can send you to go look at. But certainly those two applications, along with applications like uh, Ceph, distributed file system storage, um, are certainly what we had in mind as we began developing the operator concept. And so to, to go just a little bit away from your question and talk about the, that idea of file storage, there is a, there's a, 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 a company and a product called Rook 
and they are kind of a enterprise packaging of a Ceph storage paired with an operator based on the operator's pattern that can manage Ceph file system clusters it's in a much more complicated, but still basically the same as what I was showing with, with the etcd cluster. It, it knows about Ceph's notions of clustering, so it can maintain those notions of clustering of who's a node, who's a leader, where's the persistent storage live in terms of Kubernetes and on top of Kubernetes. So there is a Rook operator, um, and, and it uh, is a, a usable production live running operator for running large distributed file systems. A lot of the problems are very similar in solving the, the large database systems issue. So yes, is it, there's a very long yes to, one of the things we'd love to manage with operators are databases. Databases are tough to manage in distributed clusters. Right now we don't have good ways to manage a PostgreSQL database in Kubernetes terms. It, we basically build a Postgres cluster off on the side, and then someone is responsible for maintaining that cluster, keeping it alive, and so, uh, yeah, it's exactly the kind of problem we want to solve with operators. So, the previous talk was about the open A previous talk talked about this idea of a, an open services API, like just sort of how to manage service endpoints is what that sounds like to me. Uh, so a set of commands added to the default Kubernetes API or a set of endpoints in that API that let you describe management of those service endpoints. My suspicion is that one, the idea of the open services API is a general pattern for all applications running on Kubernetes, whereas while an operator might do very similar work or even itself use such an API to implement its work, it will continue to be more application specific for an etcd, for a MySQL, for a PostgreSQL. The thing that distinguishes operators and that I think, you know, it actually in software engineering, you try very hard to generalize everything you can and reserve the specifics to the places where they must live. Part of the idea of operators is they are that place where, since there have to be some specifics, this is where they should live. These custom controllers, these third party resources. My suspicion is that the API from the previous talk is much more general and would be a general Kubernetes feature Whereas you would build an operator for your application that you run at your work and that I may not know anything about. And I think that's how they would differ. Now again, I'm, I'm, I know this much about an idea for, for a services API and an endpoint control API. Uh, so I have an idea of what you're talking about, but I didn't see the previous talk. So it's a little hard to do a direct compare, but I, I think those are the guidelines and, and certainly what distinguishes operators is their specificity to particular applications. That's so what's, what's different about them than the work we do every day upstream on stock open source Kubernetes is we're trying all the ways to generalize and abstract the stuff we're putting in the main code base and reserve the specifics and the intricacies of individual application design to, to these operators. Reasonably good answer? I like, can you score me? Does anybody else have any questions? Hey, Susan, do you have anything to add to that? Yep. You, okay. All right, thank you very much. Hey, thanks for coming.